Uh, my name is uh, Eric Andrit, and um, uh, the reason I'm concerned about uh, the property taxes and the tax assessment in our city is because the system is not fair. Um, the system by design is based on market value, um, and the market is based on uh, the will of people with capital to either purchase homes or have interest in the homes. In particular, when we look at the assessment of property value in communities, the same house, same style, owned by different people in different communities, historically by the market, has been defined differently. So when you have a real estate market that's defining the value of homes based on who's willing to pay for that home and what that neighborhood looks like. So in, 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 in particular, we can look at this community that we're in right now. This is a historic African-American Caribbean, uh, St. Helena and native community. And as such, the property value of a house built the same year, with the same wood, the same materials, and even maybe the same architect and construction company would have a different value than a home that was built on Hawthorne Street. Um, based on nothing but discrimination in the market. So when we have a system, when we have a tax system that's based on um, taxes are supposed to be for a public good, to make sure that everyone is uh, participating and we have resources to have a common wealth, that we take this wealth in our community and put it forth um, to the needs of the community. When it's based on a system that is already unfair, what you're gonna get is a system that's unfair by design. So part of our problem is not so much um, is the design itself is flawed. The design in, 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 as it is, is set up that the free market, the capitalists and the market can influence the value of the home. So for example, we're in a community right now where there's people buying homes at 50,000 to 60,000 above the market rate. That's gonna increase the property value in these homes and we're already facing gentrification, in particular in our communities. Our communities have been harmed by the assessment of our homes uh, in the sense that many homeowners were not able to pull out equity to fix their homes if they had an issue with their roof or they wanted to send their kids to school or college. Um, because of the value was devalued because of the community they came from and who they were, they didn't have that. And now these same communities, because people are coming in and buying homes at a, uh, a rapid rate, uh, are going to face the brunt of that taxation. So the services ain't changed, your income hasn't changed, but this system is designed so that those that have access to capital can survive in a system where the market value is going up by the capital uh, and the interest in the community. So this is a, a, a harmful system that is harming our community and we need to have protection for community members so that they're not pushed out of our community by ri uh, rising interest in communities and then uh, the gentrification is affecting the home ownership and the rental but also this property tax and this assessment this year is going to be really problematic. With the expected railroad completion, manufacturing, and waterfront, waterfront development, communities are concerned with gentrification. What is your perception of this, and how will the assessors offer assistance for community? Um, I think that this is a huge problem. This is a really, really big problem that we're facing right now in terms of the displacement of, of community. We heard a lot of issues in the city council debate about the impacts that that has on our community and what it does to people and what we're, we're facing, whether it's in the uh, homelessness that we spoke about and the single single uh, parent homes that uh, people are living outside of their homes, that this increase in property tax liability is pushing people that have limited income into a situation where they're not able to afford to pay their taxes. And as the, the rail comes in, the way that the system is designed currently is that if wealth comes into a community, your property value, your income didn't change, your, your, the size of your house didn't change, but now you're going to be taxed because of something that came in is changing the perceived value. It's perceived. The space hasn't changed, but the perceived value changes. And now you have a lot of elderly people in a community that are on a fixed income because they're retired. You have a lot of people that have limited income. Someone said that the average uh, income in the city was $20,000. Now, if the property tax goes up and you're not a homeowner, the rent goes up. So we as renters are paying taxes. A lot of times, often we hear people who own homes uh, labeling the taxpayers as only the homeowners. But homeowners that are renting out homes, they're renting it out for profit. It's a profitable business. And as these rails come in and as more people come into the, to the community, 
If we don't have protections set up, then this tax, which is supposed to go for a public good, is going to do a public harm because it's going to harm elderly people, it's going to harm people with low income and fixed income, and they're not going to be able to afford to live in the community that they have, may have spent generations creating and paying taxes on. So obviously, we're going to have to Obviously, um, I'm not looking to, for, uh, to displace families with um, speculators coming into neighborhoods and causing these values to arbitrarily increase. As the assessors, we are not, we can't predicate who comes in and buys properties. We can't tell people who to, you know, who to sell their properties to or at what price. So unfortunately, there's nothing in the state laws that allows us to make uh, adjustments to property tax valuations for, you know, for um, family neighborhoods or historical, like historic neighborhoods, the makeup of those historic neighborhoods. Um, you know, I, I've grown up in um, my grandparents' house growing up. I, I lived on the third floor, they lived on the first floor. My husband and I live in his parents' home, so I do believe
to address gentrification. Uh, Everything that we do as, as the assessors is really based off of the state law. Uh, that's Mass General laws for all of, the, all of the cities and towns of, of Massachusetts. So I'm not quite sure that any of the city council could have actually change those laws. I'm not, no, I'm not quite clear that they could. Well, the same thing could you advocate the state legislative delegation of the benefit to try to change the laws? Um, I don't know how, I mean, we have, I guess we could reach out to them if, if I just don't know the process that that would take, because um, it's really, it's really predicated, everything is based off of the state law, um, mass general law, so it would really, it would have to be through the state legislature to make those changes, so we could go in that direction. I'm not quite sure that's the role of the assessor, but we could, you know, give as much information as we could to provide that support to make that decision, but that would be out of our hands. I think that um, we have the ability, whether we're in the seat where you are sitting at, or the seat here, or the seat in city council, um, to advocate and create change, and it's about uh, a slow process, unfortunately, for, for change, but when we're faced with crises, um, but the crisis comes opportunity, and we're in a crisis point right now, um, already. And with the assessments that are going on right now, um, and when they come out, you're gonna see an increase in the property value for many folks, and you're gonna see a lot of people squeezed even further than they are now. So it's really important, despite the fact that it may not be that position uh, in title and, and job description. In fact, I struggled to find a job description um, online for, for the assessor's office, and um, I went to the office, they didn't have a job description there, but I ended up running into an assessor as they were doing an assessment, and they were informing me that the, the, the model, and when he explained the model, it just it was apparent how flawed it is. Um, you live next door to Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips paints his house, your property value is gonna go up based on the formula that uses the proximity to wealth to address you. So, if we have a, 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 a commonwealth where we're thinking about we collectively use our, pool our wealth together to, for the betterment, for the education, for the infrastructure of our community, if the way that we're, we're, we're assessing that, that wealth is actually harming people, um, and it's not really doing a service to the people of the community, it's harming the people in the community. So there really needs to be a change, and that change has to happen on a uh, uh, state level. Um, and you, we've had people in our city advocating for this in the 80s. I saw articles written in the 80s where they were talking about switching from a property tax value to an income tax and then also having a commuter tax. Instead of uh, this model of property tax, which is, was extremely flawed, and there's several people across the country have been advocating for different models. Um, so I think that this is something that we need to push this idea forward. And also, with what is there, we have to find the, the gaps that protect people that are in a fixed income that can't afford it because now all of a sudden your taxes go up $300, $200 a month, you can't afford it, you get behind. Someone can purchase your liability and then charge interest on that. So this is a way that gentrification happens also. I witnessed firsthand individuals coming in from out of the country, purchasing a home and leaving a government residence in a state of homelessness. If you have the opportunity, or I should say, are you willing to go to state legislature to make appropriate changes for our citizens? And if so, what would that look like and what would you be advocating for? I, I've already decided to do that. Uh, I spent a lot of time last year uh, advocating for some housing bills around the lift of rent control and other issues around other issues and advocacy uh, at the state level. Um, so that's something that is something that is crucial in this in particular. And it's something that I'm gonna do whether I'm in this position or out of this position. But it's clear that we really need to um, address at the root, which is the Department of Revenue and how we're defining uh, the model and the formula that they're using. Because if you're using a broken formula, no matter how well-intentioned you are, the system is flawed from the beginning. So that flaw is harming people and it, we, need to get, we need to get out there ahead of this. This needs to change like yesterday. So, with regards to 
what people are paying for taxes, ultimately it's partly based off of the budget of the city. The, if the, for instance, hypothetically, if we cut everybody's values in half, the tax rate is just going to double. Everybody has to pay the same, you know, we're going to have to still come up with the same amount of taxes to cover the, the spending of the city. So I know that you're, you know, we're, you're referencing, but the plot calculation or whatever, that's just coming up with the values of the property across the city of Bedford. Ultimately, in order to reduce everybody's taxes, we have to reduce spending. So, I, you know, I'm not quite sure where, you know, we could certainly, you know, go to the legislator and if that, if the rules get changed, we would have to follow them and we would follow them. It's just, right, I mean, in order to cut taxes, though, really have to cut the spending on the city. So that's the ultimate, you know, issue here. How many hours per week do you, do you uh, spend uh, on city business in the city? Uh, and you may do, you may do some time, uh, spend some time outside city hall and city business. Right, because right now we're doing general so, health. Right health, now we're doing health. everything through Zoom meetings still, so uh, it, it varies depending on the, t the time of year. So right now it's a slow year. We haven't. Um, there's not a lot of uh, um, you know, abatement applications that we have, so it's probably maybe, you know, only a few hours a week. There are other. There have been other weeks where it's a lot more. Um, we do a lot. You know, some communications. You know, we get the information to review ahead of time, but we haven't had a lot of abatement applications recently to to really spend. Our Mr. Andrew, I'm sure you said you'd spend all the hours you need to spend to do the job. So, from what I what I what I was told when I went to the office, they said it was a 20 hour a week uh, expectation, but it, it clearly is probably predicated on what the workload is. But uh, that's what the assumption I had was it was a 20 hour a week position. Um, but um, things things uh, uh, that's a that's a question that uh, I couldn't answer. Um, because I'm not in that position at this point in time. So this is a philosophical question that you wouldn't normally ask in an assessment for this year because of the issues that, that are being raised much of education. I, I would ask, isn't there an argument to be made that education is a good thing for the city, especially a city like New Bedford brings in professional people who are going to spend money, maybe create jobs, uh, um, uh, fix up the property. Uh, isn't there an argument that such identification is, is good? I do agree with what, what you're saying. And I think that. I don't think there's a yeah. yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it is good with regards to people coming in, you know, new communities. Like I said before, it's not, I'm not looking for people to get displaced out of the neighborhood. We can't really tell people who to sell their property to, who not to, but having people come in from out of town and, you know, do, you know, significant renovations to properties that have been, you know, just kind of not been taken care of over the years, that is a good thing for the city. And, you know, unfortunately, it does ultimately, you know, bring up values in that neighborhood. However, again, the ultimate taxes that you pay are really based off of the city budget and the spending of the city. Um, that would meet those needs. So, for example, 
uh, an income tax um, that that may resolve that problem. That that's that's something that could be looked at. Um, also, as was said by some of some of us, uh, Linda Mara was talking about nonprofits. Uh, we have uh, institutions uh, like uh, in, in Massachusetts. We have a lot of uh, for prof profitable educational institutions that have endowments in the millions that bring in a lot of uh, use into the public works and the needs. Uh, BCC and, and, and University of, of Massachusetts and Dartmouth, uh, institutions that are adding on to the burden in our community. And uh, those, those institutions are a little different from the Harvards, which are in a very different situation, but these things are, are, are things that I think that we really have to really relook re at, and we also have uh, other institutions, but that's a radical change that would take a, a, lot of, a lot of time to change, and I think that gentrification is uh, a very harmful thing. I think that, like, if, you have, if you're a gardener, if you plant plants and you transplant plants and you take them out the soil, you'll see the harm that happens, and the most healthy ecosystems are the systems where the roots in the systems are deep, and what we have in this community is we have communities that may not have economic opportunity because they've been locked out of opportunity. So we're dealing with a disparity and discrimination and a lot of things that have created the situation where some homeowners have not been able to upkeep their home simply because their property value has been devalued. They haven't been able to uh, access equity. They haven't been able to be, been supported by these banks. They've, they've had predatory loans. They've had all these harmful years of history. And these communities have bared the brunt of that for 400, 500 years. And now, with this redevelopment coming into our communities and with those, a lot of the development really interested in the downtown area that abuts our communities. A lot of communities that are marginalized people of African indigenous descent are, at harms, are being harmed by gentrification in a way that it destroys the fabric of a community. And when you do that, uh, there's something special that's really lost. And I, I think that we can't uh, think gentrification is something that's good. What are the most important issues or challenges that will face the census office this year for the foreseeable future? And how would you address those challenges? I think the issue we, we've talked about most of this time is that in this last year, we have prospectors and folks from outside of our community buying their homes at a, a, a alarming rates above the market rack, uh, value. We have homeowners being targeted with letters that I don't even have the homes up for sale. There's so much interest in that, that this market value is gonna go up dramatically and that this is a serious impact that's gonna happen. Once these assessments come forward in January that they've been assessing, you're gonna see an increase in, 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 in the, the, the rental rates, you're gonna see an increase in the, 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 the bills that folks have, and that's gonna, a community that's already struggling with COVID, who's already struggling with uh, historic unemployment, historic underpaid uh, employees are going to be pushed even further. And if we think that the situation where people are complaining about homelessness downtown, people fail to look at the things that are pushing people out of their homes outside of just uh, the stigmas that are, are put out there that people are, are, are addicts and such. And some of that addiction is, 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 is pushed by folks being pushed outside. And then they're in the cold and they're drinking liquor to keep themselves warm. So this uh, uh, property tax valuation uh, and how, how this is done is a, a major issue. It has been an issue if we look back and how historically it's harmed our community. You're going to see that there's a long history of how it hasn't really uh, benefited everybody. So, again, the whole process of assessing the values of the properties starts pretty much in January, we're looking at two years worth of sales. The fact that the sales price and prices, people are paying a little bit more for properties now than what they were a couple years ago, it will factor into the calculation of the assessed values because we're looking at them over, over a two-year span. However, the ultimate tax that you're paying is really going to not change unless the budget changes. So if the property values increase, the tax rate will, is lowered. Ultimately, the two combined equals the budget. It equals enough to cover the spending of the city, of the, city the budget. If the property values decrease, a few years back when we had that you know, crisis, then the tax rate increases.
increases, the two combined still have to cover the city spending. So ultimately, where all, all of the values are increasing, you know, but ultimately the overall amount that you're going to pay for taxes is still ultimately determined by the budget. And in order to decrease those taxes, we need to have, you know, if people are concerned, they should go to the city council when they're creating the budget and, to, you know, voice their opinion at that point. Um, I'll, again, you know, the values go up, the tax rate goes down. Ultimately, we're going to pay the same. All right, it's time for the closing uh, statements here. We get to uh, uh, have uh, maybe a short amount of time, so uh, a minute or so. I want to start with this one. Uh, my name is Eric Gandry, and I'm um, running for tax assessor in the city of New Bedford. Um, our major concern is the, the, the style in which, uh, and the formula that is used to assess the property values in our community, and also making sure that our families and our communities understand the, the ways in which the tax values are uh, set, and also ways in which they, they can uh, apply if they're senior citizens. And also, I want to look into other options of how we could uh, have a different ta tax model and, and advocate on a statewide level for our community. I'm somebody that is not afraid to look at something and say it's, it's flawed and that if it's flawed, then we need to advocate and we have to change consciousness around it and we have to organize around it. I have a history of organizing. I have a background in computer science. Uh, I don't have a, a tax background, but I took differential equations and calculus and all kind of math and I'm, I'm a, a fast learner. But also I think that my goal would be to be an advocate for our community and a change. Thank you.